zero on your telephone keypad. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to turn the call over to Yona Lloyd, Vice President, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us to discuss our 2021 first quarter financial results. On the call with us today are our Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Yoav Zaif, and our Chief Financial Officer, Lilas Pajorski. I remind you that access to today's call, including the slide presentation, is available online at the web address provided in our press release. In addition, a replay of today's call, including access to the slide presentation, will also be available and can be accessed through the Investor Relations section of our website. Please note that some of the information you will hear during our discussion today will consist of forward-looking statements, including, without limitation, those regarding our expectations as to our future revenue, gross margin, operating expenses, taxes, and other future financial performance, and our expectations for our business outlook. All statements that speak to future performance, events, expectations, or results are forward-looking statements. Actual results or trends could differ materially from our forecast. For risks that could cause actual results to be materially different from those set forth in forward-looking statements, please refer to the risk factors discussed or referenced in Stratasys' annual report on Form 20F for the 2020 year, which we filed with the SEC on March 1, 2021. Please also refer to A, our Operating and Financial Review and Prospects for the first quarter of 2021, as well as B, the press release that announces our earnings for the first quarter of 2021, which are attached as exhibits to two separate reports on Form 6K that we are furnishing to the SEC today. In order to obtain updated information throughout the year concerning our quarterly results of operations and the risks and other factors that most impact those results, please see the quarterly earnings press releases and our quarterly operating and financial review and prospects, each of which are attached as exhibits to reports on Form 6K that we furnish to the SEC on a quarterly basis over the course of the year. Stratasys assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements or information which speak as of their respective dates. As in previous quarters, today's call will include GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. The non-GAAP financial measures should be read in combination with our GAAP metrics to evaluate our performance. Non-GAAP to GAAP reconciliations are provided in tables in our slide presentation and today's press release. Now, I would like to turn the call over to our Chief Executive Officer, Dr. Yoav Zaif. Yoav? Thank you, Yona. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, I will touch on the highlights of the first quarter and share insights from a very exciting global event we held last week. At Stratasys, we have committed to being at the forefront of the polymer 3D printing market, producing and delivering the most innovative next generation technologies that address the fastest growing manufacturing applications. 3D printing is migrating from being primarily a prototyping tool to providing full scale digital manufacturing platforms at mass production levels. Stratasys is leading this transformation with manufacturing applications in polymers, which we believe is a higher value opportunity than metal. This year has gotten off to an exciting start for strategy. Last week, we hosted an unprecedented online event attended by over 4,500 customers, resellers, and partners. At the event, we provided details on three new manufacturing focused product offerings that will play an integral role in our future growth. We continue to be energized by the tremendous potential that our business and our industry has, especially in end use part manufacturing. We expect this demand driver to produce compound annual growth of over 20% starting next year. We believe that our leadership position in 3D printing will strengthen as we execute on delivering current products while expanding and launching additional new products. Turning to our results for the first quarter, 
our revenues of $134.2 million were in line with our previously stated outlook. We saw particular strength with nearly 41% growth in system revenue, which should drive future recurring revenue from consumables. Our operating cash flow was $22.8 million, following last quarter, $23.7 million. During the first quarter, we achieved several important milestones to drive our strategy. We continued our focus on expanding the GrabCAD software platform with the launch of the GrabCAD software partner program. This is an ecosystem of software providers integrating their offerings with strategies to provide our customers with end-to-end -end additive manufacturing solutions. The program will enable customers to expand on their prototyping and manufacturing workflows to better address the opportunities for 3D printing. We also released the GrabCAD Connectivity Software Development Kit, SDK. This will enable developers and customers to integrate our technology in their factories and make them Industry 4.0 compatible. Our Connectivity SDK is a sophisticated two-way communication platform. Our customers can monitor their fleet of Stratasys printers and also use enterprise software applications like MES or ERP to communicate back. In addition, we added the industry standard MT Connect communication protocol to more systems to support data exchange between manufacturing software applications used for monitoring and analytics. This recent software releases support our customers increasing deployment of our additive manufacturing products to the production floor. We introduced our J5 DentaJet 3D printer to serve the growing demand for dental solutions. It is the only multicolor, multi-material 3D printer enabling technicians to load mixed trays of dental parts. It can produce five times more dental parts on a single mixed tray than any of our competitors offering in a compact, office-friendly size. We have already started to see excellent customer attraction, such as Neo Lab in Massachusetts, which serves 3,000 orthodontics and dental clinics across the U.S. Our customers are impressed by the J5 ease of use, multiple models, in one print, minimal post-processing, and the fact that models go from concept to production faster than ever. The dental industry has been an early adopter of additive manufacturing for true production parts, and is currently over a billion dollar opportunity for 3D printing. We also introduced a new carbon fiber material for our award-winning F123 series 3D printers that is specifically formulated for applications such as tooling, jigs, and fixtures. The strength and lightweight of carbon fiber make it an excellent replacement for metal across many applications. We acquired RPS, adding a top quality product line of industrial stereolithography systems complementing our portfolio to give us a full suite of polymer 3D printing solutions across the product life cycle, from concept and design to end use path. We continue to expect the acquisition to be slightly accurate to revenue and non-GAAP earnings per share by the end of 2021. <clears throat> our customers continue to validate our innovation and technological advances as evidenced by the recently signed contract extension and expansion with Airbus. The agreement significantly increases the range of cabin interior components and other parts. This is a perfect example of how Stratasys executes a land and expense strategy. The original agreement signed over five years ago only focus on parts 
for the Airbus A350 as an alternative to traditionally manufactured power, increasing supply chain flexibility. Once Airbus started printing power with our FDM technology, they soon progressed from a small number of alternate parts to using the technology for serial production at a much larger scale. We are also able to provide on-demand power service through our Stratasys Direct Service Bureau. The updated agreement increases the range of aircraft types to also include the A300, A320, A330, and A340, as well as replacement and spare parts to MRO applications. Our additive manufacturing is now part of the typical interactions with procurement through standard supplier channels as a regular course of business. As I mentioned earlier, last week at our manufacturing launch event, we announced three new product updates, which will strengthen our market-leading offerings and value potential that we bring to customers. The Stratasys Origin One best-in-class photopolymer 3D printer that received a top-to-bottom optimization upgrade to improve serviceability, performance, and utilization. Key use cases include medical device components, automotive, aerospace, defense, consumer goods, and dental applications such as splints, bridges, aligners, and dentures. We also shared some great insights from Origin customers. Specifically, we highlighted TE Connectivity, a leader in connectors and sensor products. They are now printing thousands of parts using Origin P3 technology, including their first ever 3D printed aerospace production connector. We plan to begin shipping this upgraded version in the fourth quarter this year. The H350 powered by Selective Absorbent Fusion, or SAP technology, and built for true thermoplastic mass production of consistently accurate end use parts. Our Stratasys Direct Service Bureau, as well as others in Europe, have already started producing parts on the H350 as better users for customers in automotive, consumer goods, and healthcare. We also introduced a renewable bio-based PA11 material that is derived from sustainable castor oil, which has superior thermal resistance and is less brittle than PA12. It is the first of many new polymer materials for the H series. And the H350 is even its own customer. A dozen parts on the system were actually printed with SAF technology. We plan to start shipping the H350 in the second half of the year. The F770, designed with the longest fully heated build chamber in FDM. It is a large addition to our F123 product line with a 13 cubic foot build volume. Despite its size, it's designed to be as simple to use as our other popular F123 printers and is priced under $100,000. In addition to the heated build chamber, the soluble support is another important differentiator from most other large format printers. This will save customers time and enable them to make more complex parts we plan to begin shipping in late June. We are on track to enter this next phase of product launches, which combined with our multiple competitive advantages, will advance our position as the leading provider of polymer 3D printing solutions for our world-class customer base. We have the broadest, most advanced polymer technologies that span the full product life cycle from concept to end part. Our polygists and FDM systems have been the best selling units in their class. And we have introduced new systems for both technologies this year with more to come. 
our recent RPS acquisition adds multi-purpose stereolithography systems to our portfolio. And we are now entering true mass production with P3 and SAP technologies. No other companies as both the range and the best-in-class innovation that Swastasys can deliver to our end market. Our software strategy, as discussed earlier, is based on the customer-centric dynamic of working closely with many OEM across the industry. We offer a unifying, comprehensive platform across our technologies that is built to interface with the top standard enterprise system. Today, GrabCAD has 36,000 application users and 8.8 million community members, more than any other platform of its kind, and is at the heart of our cloud-based strategy and growing software ecosystem that includes partnership with Siemens and topology, Identify 3D, Link 3D, Keyshot, and others. Supporting our product, we have the leading global channels that can market, sell, and maintain our system for our customer. Over the years, we have built an unmatched sales and service infrastructure with market access across a network of over 200 channel partners. This is the largest and most experienced channel in the industry. The success of these systems and technologies relies on the talented teams that build, manage, and maintain them. These are the expert application engineers that educate the market and continue to push the innovation envelope each day as they work with customers to address an ever-expanding universe of applications. Stratasys has the largest team of engineers and customer support in our industry. They have deep, multidisciplinary experience, especially in quality and process certification, which is critical for success in aerospace, automotive, healthcare, and other sectors. And we have a proven resilient business model designed to scale across a range of macroeconomic conditions, including our successful navigation of the COVID-19 pandemic. We believe that as our revenue growth accelerates, we can leverage our model and deliver increasing profit while continuing to generate cash. These key advantages, combined with the new technologies that we launch in the future, position strategies to deliver on our growth strategy. We expect that as our customer return to their production facilities, we will benefit from the pent-up demand. I will now turn the call over to Lilach, who will share the financial result of the quarter. Lilach? Thank you, Yoav, and good morning, everyone. We are pleased to have delivered on our stated goals this quarter. The revenue growth, especially the 40.9% growth in our system sales, along with our strong cash generation, support our cautious optimism around the continuing economic recovery from COVID-19. For the first quarter, total revenue was 134.2 million in line with our previously disclosed outlook. On a constant currency basis, total revenue declined 1% versus the first quarter of 2020. Product revenue in the first quarter was 90.3 million, an increase of 8.6% compared to the same period last year, or 6.1% on a constant currency basis. Within product revenue, system revenue increased 40.9% compared to the same period last year, and increased 37.6% on a constant currency basis. This growth rate demonstrates signs of end market recovery compared to 2020, where system sales were lowest 
in the first quarter. This was due to the impact of COVID starting in the back half of the quarter, when our sales are typically strongest. System sales began to improve by the end of Q2 last year. So while we expect system growth to continue throughout 2021, the comparable percentage rate will naturally come down over the course of the year. As we noted on our last call, consumable utilization is subject to the impact of COVID. This quarter, consumable revenue was off by 8% compared to the same period last year and was down 10.2% on a constant currency basis. As the market recovers from COVID and usage rates of our systems increase, we expect to see sequential growth in consumables build as we move through the balance of the year. Service revenue was 43.9 million, down 11.8% compared to 49.7 million at the same period last year. On constant currency basis, service revenue was off 13%. Within service revenue, customer support revenue was 27.6 million, a 2.2% decline compared to 28.3 million the same period last year, and decrease of 4.3% on a constant currency basis. We continue to see softness in our part service bureau business, SDM, which has notable exposure to commercial aerospace where COVID recovery has been slower than for other industries such as healthcare and education. Gap cost margin was 41.4% for the quarter compared to 45% for the same period last year. Non-gap cost margin was 46.7% for the quarter compared to 48.4% for the same period last year. The pressure on gross margin is due primarily to the lower proportion of consumable, increased logistic costs, and lower SDM contribution. As a reminder, SDM has a relatively high percentage of fixed costs, so the lower revenue has an impact on gross margin. We believe that impact from the logistic issue, a well-known global situation, as well as the slower COVID recovery impact on consumables will remain for the near future. Given the ongoing uncertainty of these issues, we expect gross margin to remain at similar level throughout the year. Gap operating expenses were 73.9 million, an improvement of 5.9 million or 7.3% compared to the same period last year. Non-GAAP operating expenses were 65.2 million, an improvement of 7.5 million, or 10.3% for the quarter, as compared to the same period last year. Non-GAAP operating expenses was 48.6% of revenue for the quarter, compared to 54.7% for the same period last year. The improvement in operating expenses was due primarily to the proactive resizing measures we took in the second quarter of 2020. From an earning perspective, gap operating loss for the quarter was 18.4 million compared to a loss of 19.9 million for the same period last year. Non-gap operating loss for the quarter was 2.6 million compared to a loss of 8.4 million for the same period last year. Gap net loss for the quarter was 18.9 million or 32 cents per diluted share compared to net loss of 21.7 million or 40 cents per diluted share for the same period last year. Non-gap net loss for the quarter was 3.8 million or 6 cents per diluted share 
compared to net loss of 10.6 million or 19 cent per diluted share in the same period last year. We generate 22.8 million of cash from operations during the first quarter as compared to generating 11.3 million of cash in the same quarter last year. This was driven by strong collections and reduction in spending and inventory levels. During the quarter, we successfully raised gross capital of 230 million of gross proceeds and, and ended the quarter with 530.4 million in cash, cash equivalents, and short-term deposit, compared to 299.1 million at the end of 2020. We have recently made strategic investments via acquisitions of Origin and RTS to help build out our product portfolio. And we continue to evaluate additional opportunities that will further accelerate our time to market and other key strategic initiatives. Last quarter, we provided our outlook for revenue growth in the second quarter and operating expenses for the full year. And we are reaffirming both. For revenue, we still expect mid-teens percent growth for Q2, and we expect to see sequential growth in the back half of the year, with the fourth quarter being the strongest. OPEX for the full year include an increase of 25 to 30 million compared to 2020, likely closer to the high end of the range. The increase is due primarily to the return to a five days work week and the cost associated with the recent acquisition. Capital expenditures are projected to be in the range of 24 million to 30 million. Looking ahead with our debt-free fortress balance sheet, we are well positioned to capitalize on value enhancing market opportunities. We will continue to invest capital into strategic high growth area of our business, particularly around manufacturing. We're increasing customer demand and a proven history of high utilization should support substantial upside in revenue earnings, and cash flow in the coming years. With that, let me turn the call back over to Yoav for closing remarks. Yoav? Thank you, Lila. Our company is executing on our strategy to expand our leadership position in polymer 3D printing. The investment we have made to drive organic growth coupled with the targeted and strategic acquisition to enhance our end-to-end -end solution portfolio should result in value creation for our shareholders. With that, let's open it up for questions. Operator? Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. We ask you please ask one question and one follow-up. If you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. Once again, that star one to be placed in the question queue, and please ask one question and one follow-up. Our first question today is coming from Shannon Cross from Cross Research. Your line is now live. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to ask, um, I guess I'll ask both questions. Uh, the, the first is with regard to product sales um, or system sales. Can you just provide a little more feedback uh, to us on, you know, exactly who are buying, what what's coming in, how much of this was pent up demand versus, um, you know, new demand because of some of the products you've launched, um, and then with regard to consumable sales, given the mix of systems that you're selling, can you give us an idea of how long it will take to see some of the the follow on consumable sales? And um, you know your your confidence level and maybe usage rates on on the products. Thank you. Good morning, Shannon. Um, some some flavor on our system sales. I will start with that. Uh, we definitely saw hardware uh, strength growth across all our platforms and regions. 
in the quarter. So there is no single product or customer that drove the favorable result. We really see it uh, across all our uh, across all our business. Uh, definitely, this growth demonstrates signs of end market recovery compared to 2020, where system sales were lowest in the first quarter. Uh, this was due uh, to the impact of COVID-19 starting in the back half of the quarter, where our sales are typically the strongest. So that's why basically you see a very strong, uh, and this quarter demonstrates a, a recovery that we are happy to see here. Um, uh, important to know the system growth will be the lead, uh, lead driver for our growth in the year. With the introduction of the new product, consumable will follow. I would like to remind you that our uh, new product will introduce more at the second part of the year and will make a more impact in Q4 as opposed to the first part of the year. But we, uh, as I mentioned, very encouraged with the recovery, uh, recovery sign that we, we saw all, already now and sure that consumable will follow. Another thing important to note that system uh, sales began to improve by the end of Q2 last year. So while we expect system growth to continue throughout 2021, the comparable percentage rate will naturally come down over the course of the year. But we do expect to see a notable growth uh, during the year. Now I will address uh, the consumable. The consumable, uh, we encourage to see continued recovery as we saw also in Q4, as, as also we saw in, Q, in, in Q3. It's still below 2020 uh, level. As a reminder, in Q1 2020, consumable and services were tracked relatively business in, as usual since COVID hit, start to hit most to the end of the quarter. So substantially, we had almost a full quarter as a comparison. Um, unlike Q1 21, uh, where COVID still impacts during the full quarter. As we are looking ahead for the year, we expect consumable to grow sequentially based on the trajectory of the uh, macroeconomic with the, the expectation that um, consumptions will come back to pre-COVID level probably at the beginning of 2020. 2022. 22, sorry. Yeah. Maybe just to add, hi Shannon, if you have, maybe just Hello. to add, overall, definitely there is a pent up. Hey Shannon. Definitely there is a pent up demand. Uh, very good to be in such a place because it's across all regions and platforms. Uh, of course, there are some different differences between different sectors, so commercial aerospace and government are slower to, uh, you know, to, to raise. Uh, mainly because of the commercial aerospace situation and uh, you know and the new administration in the U.S. But we see the recovery coming in the next quarter on the government side, and of course healthcare and dental, like we discussed before, are early to recover. And what is new in uh, Q1 was that education really joined uh, the healthcare and Delta in terms of uh, fast recovery. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Troy Jensen from Lake Street Capital. Your line is now live. Hey, uh, thanks Troy, for taking my question. Um, first one here for Yoav. Um, you know, if you look at results, Yoav, you know, Q1 was relatively in line with consensus. Q2 guide seems to be in line with consensus. If you continue that in the second half, you're going to have about 8% growth this year. But some of that's acquired, right, from RPS and Origin. Some of that's going to come from the Czar partnership. You know, if you look at your marketing slides that you use, you talk about an industry that's growing 20 to 25 percent. So I'm just curious, you know, what's the real outlook here for FDM and Polyjet, and why aren't you guys growing faster than the industry if the core products are, you know, sustaining kind of that industry share, and then you're adding new technologies into your portfolio? Hi, Troy. Thank you for the question. As you know, we are not guiding the year, the overall year, because of the uncertainty of the COVID, and we give just a uh, very specific direction where we can commit and where we see where we have good visibility. So I can just repeat it. In general, what we are seeing is a, con a sequential growth 
a quarter over quarter. We see the pent-up demand, as we mentioned. We know exactly where we will be in terms of the OPEX, like uh, Lilach mentioned. But overall, when you look at our, on our NPI status, and we are delivering. We were with the J55, we launched the J5 Dental with very good traction in the market. We launched the carbon fiber. We are delivering. We have a structured plan and we are delivering on it. We launch a new product both on FDM and Polyjet. Put it together with the pent up demand, we see a good, uh, I'll take good uh, uh, market. Uh, interest in those new products which are really at the top of the line and the next generation both in material jetting and in, in material extrusion. We are leading the industry in terms of the technology here. There is no doubt. And we hear it from our customers. So just take, you know, both into your analysis the fact that we have those new products both on Polyjet and on FDM to the fact that we have three new technologies that we are introducing at the second half of the year, and I guess you can do the math by yourself. Okay. And just a follow-up for you, Yoav, um, you know, would you agree that Fortis really hasn't had competition specifically in Alt-Temp? And do you fear that there's competition coming now, given that the, uh, the patents for the heated build chamber have, uh, have expired? You know, I had a call, just to share a call with a customer, I cannot uh, reveal their name, but like the top top five aerospace players in the world. And they told me, and I'm quoting, because I prepared myself for this uh, call, they said, you have the best machine out there in FDM. Just help us to make it a manufacturing machine. And that's what we are doing in terms of software, in terms of uh, material. You mentioned Ultem. It's clear that we have the best heated chamber in the market. And also in terms of software, material, but not less important, certification, regulation, allowables, all this full package that we are the only one who has it. So even if someone is coming with, with Ultem, is still many years behind us in terms of certified it to aerospace and automotive. And we are keep working. Our, you know, our people are keep pushing on new patents, on new, on new IP, on better heated chambers, on better processes, on regulation. And Airbus expansion is the, you know, it's the perfect proof for it. All right, <clears throat> good luck in the second half. Thank you, next question today is coming from David Mizrahi. From Berenberg, your line is now live. Hey guys, um, so I understand the higher operating expenses in 21, but could you just speak to how you're thinking about some of that leverage moving into 22? Do you have any goals you're targeting, targeting to just with respect to those operating expenses? Hi David, good morning. So specifically, we are not providing a specific guidance in terms of 2022, but definitely I can speak with you in the overall um, a, a business model that we are anticipating. Um, it's important to remember that uh, as our revenue will grow with the new adoption of our new manufacturing-based system, we expect to see higher profit. Higher profit uh, as we're going to have a higher profit pool, and we are planning to leverage scale on an operating model. We have in place already the infrastructure in corporate and in go to market to capture new technology without adding significant cost in the long term. And this is really our vision, this is, the, this is our goal at, at, in 22 and, and, 22 and, and beyond, in 2023, we definitely will be able to see this uh, leverage on the revenue. Got it, okay. And then can you just also comment on how the new printers will impact gross margins going forward? You know, the H350, for example, I know it uses fewer consumables. So I'm just really curious about gross margin impact from the new printers and particularly also the H350 and its competitive advantages relative to HP's uh, multi-jet fusion, for example. Thanks.
Okay, David. Um, so we are now not specifically addressing the new product. Uh, once we launch, we will be uh, speak uh, more to that. But our vision at the end of the day that uh, gross margin is a, a, we have a wide portfolio and definitely it's a it's a mixed issue. Okay, and so overall it's a mixed issue. But under manufacturing strategy, revenue will be significantly higher, driven by high consumption, which ultimately generates a higher profit, even if consumable margin may be uh, lower uh, uh, at this model. Plus, we have a design for cost initiatives in place for the new product and for the existing product that we will address uh, over time in the, future, in the future as we roll out those new products focus on improving the cost as product will be more mature as part of the product life cycle. This is something that we definitely uh, are actively addressing. Maybe just to add to Lila, the systems are in line with our overall uh, profitability. We are living within our industry, although we are not giving uh, gross margin guidelines, as you know. But I want to relate to the question about H350. We are very proud of the H350. You know, it's really a step change in, in our industry in terms of mass uh, manufacturing. So, of course, I'm not going to uh, relate directly to HP, but I'm happy to share several advantages that the SAF uh, has, the SAF technology. And, you know, I'll do it very short. We have a whole list of advantages, but in a nutshell, I would say consistent accuracy. And I mean that we have the highest consistency of part accuracy. This is must in manufacturing. The second one, second advantage, is full control of the printing process and parameters, which is super important because it enables fast certification of parts and materials, which is critical in manufacturing. Everything here is about manufacturing. And the third advantage is really very good economics because we are working with single fluid, we are uh, having high powder reuse rate, and we, accept, we have an exceptional nesting efficiency in terms of the load that you can put of part in the cake. So really, it's, a, it's an amazing machine. We have great uh, plans around it, and we are going to reveal more and more materials uh, for this platform. Also, um, you know, David and Diona, also, I would add this as well because you talk about the ability to manage uh, uh, against competition. Remember that we have a very large service bureau uh, that's technology agnostic, and it includes uh, HP, it includes uh, EOS, it includes lots of systems from lots of companies. So as we're doing our own research and development for our own products, we're actually customers using other products, and it really informs our ability to make decisions to develop the best-in-class uh, competitive systems out there. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Noelle Diltz from Stiefel. Your line is now live. Hi. Uh, thanks. Good morning. Um, I was hoping that you could expand a little bit on what the M&A pipeline looks like and, you know, specifically, if you could speak to if there's been any, um, how, how you're thinking about valuations for targets. You know, obviously the multiples for a lot of the publicly listed companies have been volatile uh, so far this year. Is that impacting uh, target pricing at all? Thanks. Hey, Noel. Thank you for the question. Uh, I'll start, you know, I'll take a step back and start with what is really important. We have a laser focused strategy. And everything that we are doing is subject to this strategy. Focus, focus, focus. And also M&A. For us, the strategy is polymer manufacturing. And we are actively looking for, uh, I would say, responsible M&A opportunities like we did and execute in the past that will accelerate the implementation of this strategy. Title above everything. And there are many opportunities. And we are very attractive to many of the startups out there, like you saw our acquisition of Origin and also RPS, because we have the infrastructure. And they want to succeed, and they want to make that they have, you know, they are growing their sales, and they have the earn out in place, and we can 
commit for it because we have the infrastructure and we have the machines to acquire and to integrate it into our system. So we are continuously looking for potential investment proactively and we want to maximize the value for our company and the shareholders and we look all over. We have a structured unit. That's the, the way we are working. And uh, this unit is going and screening and scouting. And uh, we are focusing on those technologies and companies that will accelerate our strategy in each one of our technologies. And, and we know exactly what is needed in the market, which is a great advantage compared to anyone else who is looking out there in terms of financial uh, investment or VCs. And we will keep doing this, and we'll keep doing it in a very disciplined way and uh, create value through those acquisitions. Okay, great. Um, and maybe just sticking with that theme, um, you know, obviously still early days with Origin and RPS, but maybe could you expand upon, you know, how, um, how things are progressing so far in terms of you know the how how the market has has received the the deals particularly origin and how things are trending relative to your initial expectations thanks thank you great question uh it's going really well i don't know if you had the chance to uh participate in our manufacturing event more than 4500 uh, high-end customers and partners participated there, a uh, significant amount of them. Actually, I would say um, around two-thirds uh, also participated in the breakout session of Origin. And all the guys were there, you know, like all the important companies from Fortune 100 and also the top uh, uh, similar Fortune 100 in Europe and in Asia participated you know, Tesla, Nike, Amazon, Apple, GM, Ford, you name it, Lockheed Martin, they were all there because they are interested in manufacturing. And we are bringing the full package for manufacturing, and that's why we created this team together with Origin, together with RPS. And if you participated just to close the loop, all those customers of us that I just mentioned, you know, the, the Tesla, the Apple, the Google, all those customers were there waiting for the origin uh, machines to be out, systems to be more precise, for the 770 and for definitely for the H350 participating actively. And we are going to deliver them the full package for manufacturing. So we expect strong demand on those uh, machines. and. You know, for me as a CEO, most importantly, I was very proud to see, you know, both in our press conference and also in our event, that at the end, we were one team. Origin, H350, the ZAR joint venture, and our FDM. You could see that this is a one team that is pushing forward our industry into manufacturing. Thanks very much. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Greg Palm from Craig Hallam Capital Group. Your line is now live. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I guess, you know, question on, on gross margin. Can you quantify the impact that you had from logistics? I'm just curious how that compares to what you, you said about SDM in, in mix overall. And if I heard you right, I don't think you're, you're expecting any improvement this year. So, you know, even as revenue increases, at least in the second half, gross margin stays at similar levels. And so it almost implies that, you know, what you're seeing is worsening because presumably there's some level of, of overhead of absorption in the second half. So just wanted to get a little bit more color there. Good morning, Greg. Specifically on the logistic, yes, we were impacted by the global logistic issue. Uh, that you saw overall, uh, we are we are not the only company who actually suffer from that. Um, and you, it's probably fair to assume that it's about one uh, percent of our gross margin that impacts uh, due to uh, those uh, logistics. Uh, 
And, um, and, and as we mentioned on the call, we expect gross margin to stay at this level through the balance of 2021, given the uncertainty around uh, the logistic, uh, high logistic cost and, and, the, and the consumable uh, impacted by uh, COVID. At the same time, I would like to mention that we are analyzing and increasing our inventory level of raw material and finished goods to avoid delay, increasing production level, uh, and prepare for C or air uh, delay in our planning process. Uh, the most important thing for us is the meeting the demand. We try, we are evaluating a wider array of shipping options to ensure we can deliver goods with minimal business and cost impact. It's very, very important for us to address this. Um, yeah, maybe I will just add to it. Uh, there is also some positive aspect. There are some positive aspects to the logistic side. So just to put a slip on the on the gross margin, gross margin is a combination of the logistic, the consumable mix, and and SDM. And uh, logistic was, you know, quite quite a large part there, and and, and really you can uh, uh, solve it out by yourself. But those are the those what really impacted our gross margin, and since there is uncertainty on the recovery on the consumable and the logistic, there is more control on the SDM side. That's why we are cautious with our uh, projections on gross margin. But what is the positive aspect of this? What is the opportunity here? You know, supply chain are fragile, and it's not only because of COVID. They were fragile before COVID because of the trade wars and because of some you know, barriers and looking forward with the, you know, the UK, Europe, Brexit, we'll see more uh, trade issues and tax uh, ice freeze. Then you saw the Suez Canal, the Suez Canal blockage and the weather issues and so on and so forth. So supply chains are fragile and are being disrupted. So it's clear to everybody that we need more resilient supply chains. By the way, we are facing the same issues. So we are also receiving some uh, parts and machines through the Suez Canal. And we, and, and we were exposed to the congestion in ports all over the world. You know, seven days, it's the average delay globally. And in some ports, it could be 10 or 20 days. So no doubt, Everybody understands that the future has to take into consideration digital inventory. This is a great solution. You have no shipping issues, no custom, no weather impact, no nothing. Instead of delivering from A to B across the Atlantic, you just deliver from A to A because you produce on the spot with digitally stored inventory. It's also an opportunity, that's what I'm trying to say. And this is practically what we call Industry 4.0. Yeah, no, it's, um, it, it, it's a good point. I, I guess just, just as a follow-up, because I'm still not entirely clear, because usually usually when, when you have a, a better volume and top line, you, you see better absorption and you see higher gross margins. So. If, if the assumption is that that volumes and top line revenue are are going to increase solidly in the second half, yet gross margins are going to stay at the same level as Q1, it implies that something is worsening from what you saw here in the most recent quarter. So, are are you assuming that that either mix or logistics or SDM worsens from here? It just Something just doesn't add up, and I just want to make sure we're all clear on that. Greg, um, I, I, we, uh, basically, we are still conservative in terms of what we see currently. No one really, really knows what's going to happen with the logistic constraint that we have. There is some publica there is some publications that even say that maybe it will take us to the end of the year. How severe it will be? Also, no one knows. Okay, so we see uh, a prices that we knew in Q1 actually now even higher what we see in Q2. So prices will continue go high. Uh, so we believe the logistic situation and challenge all, uh, all over will impact yeah. us significantly. That's a great point. And also the prices went really up and more to the end 
at least our prices of logistics from China and from uh, Israel uh, went up more at the end of the quarter. So we are being cautious. But I want to make one thing very, very clear. It's all about mix, as we mentioned, and logistics and SDM. But overall, APS in general stayed at the same level. This is ASPs. Sorry, ASPs. Right. <laughs> so the average selling prices stayed more or less in general in the same uh, ballpark, and the issue is not coming from there. This is very important to mention. Okay, great. Really helpful. Thanks so much. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Brian Drab from William Blair. Your line is now live. Thanks. I, I was going to ask uh, something that's kind of related to pricing as well, but just specifically on consumables. You know, you're down 10% organically year over year in, in consumables, um, but I would think customer activity would have increased materially year over year, given many of the service bureaus, manufacturing design companies were shut down or at least slowed down materially last March. And also, if you, you know, if you compare it with first quarter of 19, if you go back two years, Consumables revenues down about 15%, and product gross margins down over 600 basis points since first quarter of 19. So, I mean, it, it, there are a few things that can explain this. I don't know—is it lower utilization of your machines? There, there. Even even though machine sales have been soft, there's more machines in the market than there were two years ago. So, is it lower utilization of those machines going out to the market, or are you lowering price in consumables, or, or, or what is it? Thanks. A great question, thank you. You know, you just answered it. It's lower utilization, definitely. It's not that all our customers are back. And even if they are back, they are not utilizing at the same level as uh, pre-pandemic. Add to it the fact that there are some segments that really uh, were heavily hit by the by the pandemic and are slow to recover, mainly aerospace and within aerospace, uh, commercial aerospace. They are slower to recover, also automotive, and we are highly uh, focusing on those because our, those are the high-end segments that are buying our high-end machines. So this is manufacturing. So we are more exposed, but I have no doubt that uh, you know, in, the, in the future we will see them coming back Strongly, the utilization will go up, and uh, consumable, as we said, will grow sequentially throughout the year. Okay, and and I guess is it the same dynamic that's playing out in the system sales? Because I mean that that's a great result that system sales are up 40 percent year over year, but they were down 40 percent year over year last first quarter, and going down 40 and then back up 40 means you're still on a two-year stack basis. You're still down 15 percent in system sales from first quarter 19 levels. Um, is that the, the same dynamic that you're just, it's going to take another year maybe to get back to 2019 levels? So, in general, yes. We don't know exactly when, you know, aerospace will be exactly in 2019. But what we can see is that hardware is, uh, as you see, because of the deep uh, decline in, in, in Q1 that we had in some areas of the world, we see this spend demand. And this spend demand is a sign for consumable because hardware is probably a phase or two phases before the consumable. So you can use the hardware in order to predict the, the demand for consumable. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Wam C. Mohan from Bank of America. Your line is now live. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, you did a capital raise last quarter. You, you're calling this uh, as growth capital. You, you obviously already have a pretty strong balance sheet before that. So how should we think about maybe pace of either M&A or investments? Is this going to be at some level of accelerated pace versus, you know, even the last last few years, or, or, or how should we think about the relative pace of investments and, and M&A? If you could share any color on that, that would be helpful. 
you know, we are we are stick we are sticking to our strategy and to the same concept that we mentioned uh, two quarters ago. We have a, we have a strategy. Part of the strategy is a structured M&A proactive. Uh, I would say proactive uh, scouting and screening to make sure that we are building pipeline for uh, M&A in a way that will maximize shareholders' value through synergies. And the synergies are very clear here. There has to be some. It has to be something that accelerates the strategy. It has to be something that. Uh, either accelerate it through technology or go to market or material or software. So we work on the workflow, which is the software and other type of workflow, or material or hardware technology. And we'll keep doing it in a disciplined way. We build an M&A team internally, and uh, it's a very strong team. Uh, we are not uh, rushed to do anything, but we do it in a very disciplined way to accelerate the strategy. Okay, thanks, Jeff. And you talk about this acceleration in, in revenue growth in 22 and beyond. What, when you think about that in relation to maybe market growth, um, are you expecting to take share and grow in excess of the market? And, and maybe if you could just talk about that growth acceleration coming between existing products and, and new products. I'm trying to isolate what, what is sort of a cyclical recovery that can drive an acceleration in 22 versus a more secular, sustainable recovery in that, in that growth. Thank you. We are going, we are leading, but also in the future. We will lead the polymer manufacturing segment. We are leading additive manufacturing in polymers. This is the strategy. This is the target. And the way to do it is by making sure that we have the right match for every application. This is why we expanded our portfolio to five technologies. In each one of them, we believe we have the best-in-class technology. And, and, you know, I'm already in this industry almost a year and a half now, and I can tell you that it's quite simple. You need to have the best part, and this is scientific. You need to make sure that you have the best part uh, properties, and we are working on it on each one of the technologies. We leverage it through our channel partners, and we are delivering to our customers with focus on manufacturing a full package of hardware, software, material, and services. And we package all of it in a seamless platform of software. This is a big advantage. This is something we heard from our customers. They want to have one supplier, and we will be this one supplier in polymer manufacturing. And as we said last quarter, we believe that our specific revenue will grow over 20% in this sector of additive manufacturing. So we are currently, as we said last quarter, in 2020, around 25% of our sales went to end-use part. We are going to grow it in the mid-teens this year and 20% from next year onwards. Thank you. Our next question today is coming technology. from. Thank you. Our next question is coming from Ananda Brua from Loop Capital Markets. Your line is now live. Hi. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for taking the questions. Um, I guess just when you guys talk about you know, when you talk about uh, the revenue acceleration beyond the twenty percent. Um, you know, seemingly starting, you know, kind of in 22 going into 23. Can you share with us, and presumably that would be sort of through most of the pent-up demand, Can could you sort of share with us if that's the case? Do you really think at that point, you know, the production systems uh, are really driving the growth 
And then uh, if they are, do you do you yet have the qualifications uh, in the key verticals, you know, kind of arrow and auto, that you would that you would need for that? Uh, and and if you don't have them, you know, what do you think the difficulty level to getting there is? Thanks a lot. And thank you very much for the question. So I, I want to be very clear, and I want to separate short-term catalyst and long-term catalyst here in the market. So we said, and again, just to clarify, that the part in our sale that is going for manufacturing, as, you, as we defined it, as end-use part, will grow mid-teens this year and above 20% from 2022 onwards. So this is the this is the statement. Why we believe in it? Because first of all there there is some there are some catalysts and pent up demand in the short term because of the recovery from the COVID, because of supply chain pressure that people want to make sure that they are insuring themselves against it, because of the entire environment that we see in the macro in the macro economy. This is one. And then which is more important, everybody is seeing the long-term trend that we are facing, which leads us to an inflection point in additive manufacturing. And this is inflection point is underlined by, as I said before, by three very strong forces. One is the need to have responsive and versatile supply chain this digital manufacturing that we discussed so many times. The second very strong th trend is the fact that additive manufacturing technology reach, I would say, new levels in terms of the ability to deliver end use part and mass production. So now we were in the hundreds, we maybe thousands, now we are in the dozens of thousands and maybe hundreds and thousands of thousands and you saw, you saw in the case of the nasal swabs that we even printed millions. So it's a different era in additive manufacturing. And add to it the third very strong trend, which is the old industry trend that you have those new segments like you know, electric vehicles and new type of aerospace solution where polymer and composites are so important for the type of the parts, for the complexity of the parts, but also for uh, the need for customization and short series of production. So it's a new era. It leads us to manufacturing. Being in manufacturing, it's a whole new story. Because in manufacturing, you need, it's about new applications. It's about new materials. It's about very strong and solid service because you cannot allow yourself downtime. And not less important, you need software. You need software in order to be connected to the manufacturing system, the MES, the, the ERP, the PLM. You need to be there. And you need to put all this in one package connected. So connectivity is also very important. And we have relationship with those blue chip customers, Fortune 100 customers, that are leading this transformation. And those OEMs are working with us to transform the industry. And you know, it give us the confidence that we are on the right direction because at the end we are not working in a vacuum, but we are working with our customers to take this industry into manufacturing. That's super helpful, Yoav. I really appreciate it. That's really great context, by the way. Thanks for that. And just a quick follow-up to that. It sounds like you have uh, like at least a good amount of the capability in place today you made you know sort of you just referenced your ability to do you know production parts of volume certain production parts of volume and i like that you're sticking your neck out and giving giving the the, the growth contacts uh so thanks for that you know this is fluid how much of sort of the capability you've mentioned software m a etc workflow how much of the capability do you think you need to get to, you know, putting together solutions, software services, like you said, putting it into one package? How, how, how challenging is that over the next, call it four to eight quarters, 
to, to get to where you want to be, where, where your production customers are saying they want you to be, to be able to really inflect that growth. I know that's a lot, but I think the context would be helpful. Thanks. And that's it for me. Another great question. We have currently the internal capabilities to deliver our strategy. Having said that, it's also clear to us that we can accelerate it. So the focus is on acceleration, not on enabling, because we can do it. But this is a great place to be when you are looking for M&A, because you are coming from a place where you have the certainty that you are good with the alternative. We are not depending on anyone to execute our strategy. We have many that can help us to accelerate. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. We reached the end of our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the floor back over to you all for any further closing comments. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Stay safe and healthy. Looking forward to updating you again next quarter. Thank you. That does conclude today's teleconference and webcast. You may just connect your line at this time and have a wonderful day. We thank you for your